This case takes place in Maryland, USA, on the 3rd of April, 1982. Stephanie Roper was a 22-year-old woman who lived in a small unincorporated community called Kroom with her mother, father, three brothers, and one sister. She was incredibly close with her family. Her mother would later state that many of Stephanie's friends would tell her that they were jealous of how close the family were. Many who knew Stephanie described her as an intelligent, caring, and popular young woman, with many friends and a very promising future. She was a student at Frostburg State University, with ambitions to pursue her dreams of becoming an artist. In March of 1982, she returned home from university to spend some time with her friends and family before returning for graduation. On the 2nd of April, Stephanie had made plans to meet up with one of her childhood friends named Lisa. Stephanie got ready and briefly spoke with her mother before leaving. She told her mother that she would likely be staying at Lisa's house for the night and would return home in the morning. Stephanie drove to Lisa's house and left her car there. The two then drove to Georgetown, Washington in Lisa's car. The two attended a couple of bars and had some drinks and danced into the early hours of the morning. It's important to note that neither of the two were intoxicated. After their night out came to an end, the two drove back to Lisa's home. However, Stephanie decided that she wanted to sleep in her own bed tonight. She said goodbye, got into her own car, and set off for home at around 3.15 a.m. The drive from Lisa's house to her parents' home was only around 20 minutes. However, only five minutes into driving along the dark rural road, Stephanie fell asleep at the wheel for a brief moment. This resulted in her veering off the road and hitting a stump. Stephanie got out of the car only to see it was undrivable, with three flat tires and damage to the axle. Shortly after this occurring, a vehicle approached and stopped next to Stephanie. Inside the vehicle was a 26-year-old man named Jack Jones, along with 16-year-old Jerry Beatty. The two had been drinking at a tavern nearby and just so happened to come across Stephanie as she had broken down. The two pulled over and offered Stephanie some assistance. After a brief chat, they told her they could drop her off just up the road where her friend Lisa lived, which was only five minutes away. Lisa agreed and got into their vehicle. As soon as she got inside, they held her at gunpoint and kidnapped her. She pleaded with the two and begged them to let her go. Instead, they drove deeper into the rural area and pulled into a remote road. There, Jerry and Jack forced themselves upon Stephanie multiple times in the back seat, holding her at gunpoint the entire time. After this, they set off again, this time driving to an abandoned house. The house was located less than a mile away from where Jack lived, and was situated in the middle of a wooded area, totally isolated. The house was incredibly run down. Much of the walls had come away, leaving small holes and openings. The two dragged her inside and began to savagely beat her, and again, forced themselves upon her a further four times. Reports also mention how they brutally tortured her too. Stephanie tried on multiple occasions to escape, Every time, the attempts failed, and to punish her for trying, they would beat her further and repeatedly kick her in the groin. During this despicable attack, the two had been using their nicknames, so Stephanie would not be able to identify them if she got away or if they decided to let her go after they were done. Stephanie began pleading with the two of them. She promised she wouldn't report it to the police and they would be able to obtain money for ransom if they chose that path. The two would later say that she cried over and over and prayed to God to be saved. However, Jerry accidentally called Jack by his name, and Stephanie heard it. The two then spoke in private about what they should do now, as if they were to let Stephanie go, she could go to the police with this information and they could be caught. After speaking for a few minutes, the two decided to kill her. Stephanie overheard them whispering and heard that they had come to a decision regarding her fate. She decided to make another run for it. This time, she was able to jump through one of the holes in the wall and onto the ground outside. She then began to run, attempting to make her way into the nearby trees, although the two were able to catch up with her. 
Jack had with him a logging chain. He stepped in front of Stephanie and swung the chain down upon her head, resulting in her skull being fractured. Stephanie was barely conscious from the blow to the head. She turned and staggered towards the woods again. She was stunned and could hardly walk, but was desperate to escape. Jack went and retrieved his 22 caliber rifle. He ran past and in front of Stephanie, took aim and fired a shot into her forehead, killing her instantly. The two then siphoned gasoline from the tank, poured it onto Stephanie's body and set her body alight. After some time passed, the flames went out. To make it harder for the investigators to identify the body, the two removed her hands and threw her body into a swamp. They then both returned home. Jack was a married man and a father to a six-year-old boy. He lived only a few minutes away from where the murder had occurred. Jerry was a high school dropout and a runaway who lived with Jack and his wife and his wife's brother. During the afternoon of the 3rd of April, Stephanie's parents became greatly concerned when she failed to return home as promised. It was very out of character for Stephanie to not come home when expected without making a phone call to her parents first. They instantly knew that something was horribly wrong. Stephanie's mother made a call to Lisa, the friend she had been with the night before. She asked Lisa if Stephanie was with her. Confused, Lisa replied no and told her that Stephanie had left her house at around 3am to make her way home. Following this conversation, Stephanie's mother called the police and reported her missing. The police were able to locate Stephanie's car shortly after. They noted how damaged the car was, however, they put down Stephanie's disappearance to her just running away. Her parents refused to believe this and instead searched for their daughter. For seven long days they looked, but found no trace of Stephanie anywhere. On the 11th of April, the police received a tip from Jack's brother-in-law, an 18-year-old named Steve Annenson. Jerry had told Steve that something bad had happened. He said that he had done a very bad crime the other night and went on to say that he kidnapped and killed a young woman. Steve was rather confused by this strange confession and didn't believe that Jerry was being entirely honest. He thought it must have been some sick joke. That was until he heard the news of a missing woman. A woman who had gone missing on the date that Jerry had said he had killed someone. Steve went and spoke to the police. He told them everything he knew and explained the story Jerry had told him. He told the police that he would lead them to where Jerry said the crime had been committed. With this tip, at 8pm on the 11th of April, Stephanie's body was found, which was completely unrecognisable. The police then arrested both Jerry and Jack, and the two were questioned about their involvement in the murder of Stephanie. Almost right away, both of them gave statements to the police. However, when speaking about the crime, neither of them showed any remorse for what they had done. Neither of them admitted to pulling the trigger or dismembering the body. They both pointed the finger at each other. The police then went and told the Roper family what had happened to Stephanie. However, they didn't go into too much detail. They told them that she had been shot and murdered. The plan was to get the family through the funeral first and then prepare them for the trial that was to come, where they would eventually learn of the horrors Stephanie suffered. However, the media got their hands on the information and released every detail. Students at Frostburg State University held a prayer vigil for Stephanie and a memorial service. Whilst the two killers were awaiting their separate trials on kidnapping, essay and murder, Jerry agreed to testify against Jack for a lesser sentence. Jerry explained in detail to the police how they kidnapped Stephanie and recalled a brief conversation he had with her. Jerry said, She asked me if I could let her go and I told her, no, I couldn't do that. She was sobbing and started talking about a painting. She said she wanted to go home and finish the painting. I asked her what it was, but she never told me. Jack Jones's trial was to be first, opening on the 20th of September 1982. 
The Roper family wanted the death penalty for Jack and Jerry. Evidence of the horrific crime was brought before the court, along with their testimonies. Jack was found guilty of kidnap, SA, and murder. Stephanie's mother, Roberta Roper, took to the stand to talk about the impact Stephanie's murder had on her family, and to speak of Stephanie's life, her achievements, her hopes and dreams, and how it was also tragically and brutally cut short. Although, just as she was about to read her statement, Jack's attorney objected. They claimed that speaking of Stephanie's life would inflame the juror's emotions, and would thus be unfair. Roberta was silenced, she was told to step down, and was not allowed to speak of the pain she and her family were suffering. The defense team then prepared some mitigating factors. They spoke in great detail about Jack's struggles with addiction and his turbulent upbringing. They also brought forward the fact that Jack had no prior convictions involving violent crime, and that if Jack was to be put to death, it would cause great, lifelong suffering for his family. The jurors decided that Jack Jones had cooperated with the police by confessing, and now appeared to be remorseful for what he had done. Due to the distasteful practice of the defense team, the Roper family were told they would not be allowed to attend some of the proceedings, nor were they notified about the progress of the trial. They had to stand with their ears pressed against the glass window of the courtroom door. The jury decided not to sentence Jack Jones to death. Instead, he was sentenced to life in prison. However, his sentence meant that with good behavior, he would be eligible for parole after only 12 years into his sentence. Jerry Beatty was next to be tried. He was found guilty and given the exact same sentence as Jack. Life in prison with a possibility of parole in 12 years. The Roper family, along with the citizens of the state of Maryland, were rightly outraged. The courts received an incredible amount of condemnation. Almost 100,000 people signed a petition demanding the court impose a stricter sentence. As a result of the backlash, an additional life term was imposed, meaning at least 23 years would have to pass before either of them could be paroled. The Roper family still felt as if the justice system had failed Stephanie. They didn't believe that Jack or Jerry deserved to ever be released after what they had done to their daughter. As for the fate of the killers today, I'm unsure. I struggle to find any further information about the two. If you are from the area and or know anything more about them, please feel free to leave a comment. It would be greatly appreciated. I can imagine that this case has left many of you somewhat angry. It's hard not to think that the killers were given preferential treatment over a grieving family and an innocent victim. The fact that the Roper family were forbidden to give impact statements or to give information as to who Stephanie was to the jury is sickening, especially since the killers were able to speak of their own backgrounds and describe how if they were put to death, it would hurt their own families. Roberta believes that the killer's defense team wanted her and her family kept far out of sight. She said, They didn't want Stephanie to seem real. They just wanted a name on a piece of paper. Despite this being an incredibly tragic case, we shall be leaving this video on a more positive note. The Frostburg State College set up the Stephanie Roper Gallery, located in the Fine Arts Building, and a scholarship was set up in her memory. Stephanie's parents, Roberta and Vincent Roper, set up about changing legislation to help victims and victims' families, including the right of victims' families to address the court before sentencing in the Crimes Victims' Rights Act of 2004. The couple helped to make this happen, so nobody else would have to suffer what they did. Roberta and Vincent also formed the Stephanie Roper Committee and Foundation, which is now known as the Maryland Crime Victims Resource Center. The organization has attorneys on staff that guide victims through the legal process, so they know exactly what to expect. The organization has handled thousands of cases, making an incredibly traumatic experience that little bit easier. On the 20th of October 2012, Maryland governor named part of Maryland Route 4, just north of Croom, in honor of Stephanie Roper, and the efforts her parents went through for victims of crime. 
A link to their organization can be found in the description. When speaking of Stephanie, Roberta said, She was a wonderful person, a wonderful friend, and a wonderful human being. She was the kind of child that every parent hopes and prays for.